We are live and in person, um, coming to you into your homes. Hi, my name is Pamela with the Quarantine Book Club with my co-admin, Susan Harper. And tonight we have Billy Best, all the way Yay! from, where are, you, where are you now, Billy? I am in Seattle right now. But that's not where you live. You're I live like, in Portland. Okay. I'm, I live in Portland. I'm just here because these people take care of my dog. Okay, cool. All right. Well, welcome to the Quarantine Book Club. Um, I would like to thank uh, our behind the scenes people who make all of this possible because I'm technologically challenged and old. I'm just going to say it. <laughs> um, Amy and Nancy Harrington with the Passionista Project. And today's live event is hosted by Amy and Nancy Harrington, sisters who founded the Passionistas Project to inspire women to follow their passions. The project features a podcast, live events on their Facebook group, and a quarterly subscription box filled with products from women-owned businesses and female artisans. And coming August 21st through 23rd, four days after my 50th birthday, mark your calendars, they will be hosting the Passionistas Project Women's Equality Virtual Summit. The three-day event will feature live panel discussions, pre-recorded presentations, daily workshops, the Passionistas Portrait Storyteller event, the LunaFest Short Film Festival, a virtual marketplace, and a pay-it-forward portal. Say that three times fast. The weekend is centered around the theme of women's equality, and intersectional feminism from a range of perspectives, including racial equality, LGBTQ plus rights, financial equity, voter suppression, ageism, physical and mental health issues, religious persecution, and so much more. The summit is free for the weekend for anyone who registers. Go to thepassionistasproject.com for more information about the summit and all of the Passionistas projects. Now that we've said that, I would like to read Billy's bio. Um, Billy Best writes the blog Beyond 60, and it's fabulous. Um, loving life, staying relevant at billybest.com. She was born in 1954 in Illinois and spent most of her childhood in rural farm country. She became a city girl in 1972 when she moved to Chicago, then on to New York City and Boston, where her career traversed waitressing, the music business, retail, and marketing communications. In 1999, she moved back to the country and lived on a farm in Massachusetts until she took off for the city again, and in 2017 landed in Portland, Oregon, where she began to write as if her life depended on it. Her first book, How I Made a Huge Mess of My Life, or Couples Therapy with a Dead Man, is an uplifting memoir about her midlife crisis, published in 2020 by Widow Speak Publishing. Welcome, Billy Best, to the Quarantine Book Club. We have very much enjoyed your book. Um, yeah. I just want to ask you a few questions that you answered on our video, but just for people who may have not seen that. Um, why did you want to write this book? Well, thanks for inviting me. And hi, everybody. I'm really glad to be here. And uh, this book I needed to write because I went through some experiences that really messed me up. And I needed to get through it and become a different person. And in order to do that, I, I needed to just get it all out there. And no better way than a memoir. Right. Yes. And how long did it take you to write this book? I started writing it in March of 2016, and I took some breaks from it because it was pretty intense, and also uh, because life intervened, and I published it in March 2020. So well, you could say it took me four years to write it, but some of that was downtime. Okay. And... So in your video, you said that you did not, I mean, this is not, you do not have an agent. Um, to, can you just talk about why you didn't go for an agent with this manuscript? I can. So I did originally think I wanted an agent. And around uh, 2018, I thought the book was done. And I sent out a couple dozen query letters to agents and uh, took about 
five months to get a response from all of them, but eventually they all responded and they all said, no, thank you. During that time, I also had some beta readers reading my book and one of them, and this, this is the unpredictability of life, one of my beta readers came back to me and said, you know, I think this would be a much better book if you rearranged the chapters. And instead of telling the story in chronological order, start with the worst thing that ever happened to you. And it really makes a difference in how the book is paced and the way there's a mix of uh, present tense and flashbacks um, continuously throughout the book. And so that made it a better book. But by the time I made it a better book, I had all those rejection letters. And then I had to ask myself if I was gonna start that process over again, which took six months, or if I was just gonna plow forward and self-publish. I'm very glad that I self-published because I think if I had been working with an agent and a publisher, it's very likely my book would still be in the can. So many authors uh, who had uh, traditional publishers with books coming out this spring have found their product put on hold by the publisher for reasons that make sense to them. But uh, I I'm not willing to just sit around and wait for other people to decide if my career is a good fit for them and if my sense of timing is uh, their sense of timing. So I decided to just uh, do it myself, publish during the pandemic, and push on through the barriers. I'm very glad you did, as someone myself who ended up self-publishing my first book because my first agent wasn't able to sell it. You know, um, I think you could do a lot with self-published, and you have. Um, you have the control over this, and um, and I've read a lot of self-published books that are not very good. You know, yours is a very good book. Yeah, it's good. And I think, I mean, if you had waited a year and queried more, you would eventually have landed an agent and maybe have gotten, you know, a really sweet deal. But, you know, in the long run, you have more control over your product. And I think, um, I think that's a smart move um, to do it that way. Um, so did you have anything planned for your book launch? Oh, yes. Oh yes, all, all my plans were canceled. But I, I have friends all over the United States. I used to work for a bookstore in Boston, so I'm really familiar with how uh, in-store appearances work. And my plan was to do a book tour and drive myself with my dog and make it a really cool road trip, blog the whole time, and uh, go visit friends, uh, back and forth across the country for a few months and just stay with people, hang out with people, visit them and do public speaking and personal appearances in bookstores everywhere I went. And of course, uh, all that's canceled. So here we are. Yes. Thank you, Zoom. But, <laughs> but I do know that you are recording the audio version of this book and you're, so you're kind of on the road here shortly to do that, which is exciting. Um, because you have a great voice and I think you'll do great bringing your book to life because it's your story. I hope so. I, and I think so. I mean, I feel pretty good about doing it. I, I have done some studio work before, so I have a frame of reference for it. And uh, I do feel like my read of it packs a punch and it would be challenging to get an actress to do what I can do with my own book. And also, you know, not for nothing, it's something to do during the pandemic. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to be busy. <laughs> yes, it is. You can only clean so much, right? That's right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna throw away all my stuff during the pandemic. Right. <laughs> I will have nothing. Um, so, okay, we have, we have some questions. Okay. Um, Susan, do you want to start or do you want to take from um, the readers? Do you want to, okay, let's do the ones this morning. We've had some people who've been really good about interacting with question of the day and thank you to all of you people. The first question came from Darlene Armstrong who 
participates a lot. And Darlene said, what is your life like today? Downsized space and living large? No, totally downsized space and living really small. I ended up in Portland in a studio apartment and uh, at, as the book explains, got rid of all my stuff and uh, live on a sort of budget I've allocated to myself to keep my mind a uh, tiny, tiny footprint and um, super manageable and also maximum freedom. So I'm really not tied down to anything and um, that still feels pretty good to me. And that's a big change from farm life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a big change from a, you know, having a big house and guests and uh, outbuildings animals. and animals and uh, I didn't want to give those things up when I gave them up. That is part of the pain of it. But now that I'm free of all of it, I wouldn't sign up for those kinds of obligations again. I don't think I could have written this book while I was trying to do all of that. Yeah. And I do yeah, feel I like the thing about keeping my life small and simple and streamlined I can keep my focus on my writing. I can keep punching out that blog every Wednesday. And um, I'm enjoying it and I feel like it's going pretty well. And uh, so I'm sticking with it. Is your dog uh, a good traveling companion? He's an awesome traveling companion. Really, really great road dog. Yeah. That's, that's important. My dog is very <laughs> important. Very important. <laughs> I have a high maintenance dog. That's Me too. Um, let's see. Do we want to do another one from this morning? Um, let's take Pamela's mother, Aura. Aura Hi, Mom. Hi. She said, you've lived such a big life and experienced so many adventures. You have enough material for writing the rest of your life. Do you have another book coming soon? You've answered that a little bit, but. Wow, that's so interesting because that's a mom question, right? That's Pamela's mom. Uh huh, that's Pamela's mom. Yeah, actually, yes. Yes, I do. Yes, I am. And yes, I will. And uh, I have had the book in mind for a long time, actually, before I even wrote this one. And it's really about my relationship with my mother and about this idea of a mother feeling a sense of ownership of her daughter's body and how my mother's relationship with uh, me and control over me really, really uh, created some very interesting and um, exotic circumstances uh, when I was in my uh, teens. So huh? what, is, okay, so this is a book exotic. about relationship. It's a prequel. <laughs> okay, so do you have a title in mind? I do, actually, yeah. My okay. Amazing Uterus. <laughs> really? <laughs> really, that's the title, My Amazing Uterus. Yeah, it all ties together. Well, and that leads me, I'm gonna, <laughs> that's kind of a natural segue for um, the title of your book. Yes. It is a, it is a long title of yes. your book. And talk to us about the decision to make that the title because we were debating whether you really did make a mess of your life. Yes, thank you for debating that because I was really hoping you would because really that's the psychological theme of the story is this idea of uh, trying to be perfect and have things look perfect and feeling like you've really failed because they're not. And in the, in the early years of writing the book, somebody would ask me what my memoir was about. And I would say, oh, it's about how I made a huge mess of my life. And I went on saying that for a couple of years. And finally, somebody in one of my writers groups said, I hope that's the title. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, it is intended to be good marketing. It is intended to be catchy. The How I Made a Huge Mess of My Life or Couples Therapy with a Dead Man 
is self-referential. It's intended to be tongue in cheek and a little bit funny, but it's also really, really true. And I will say that today, I don't feel like I've made a huge mess of my life because that book came out and it's doing really well. And I'm so happy to be here with all you guys talking about this. And I'm proud of the work that I've done. And there was a high price to pay for all of it, but here we are. And so I think the, the lesson is, you know, perfection is a mirage. It's a myth. And I think we all go through phases when we feel like we've made a huge mess of things. And um, I certainly did then, and I don't now. But it, it, uh, it works well as the title for the book, and that was definitely part of the choice. We got, a, we got a really good question from Amber Lummis. Yep, Amber. Right now. Okay. Uh, she wrote, um, if Chet were still alive, do you think you would have ever gone to actual couples therapy? How do you think your healing process would have been different? I think it's very possible that if Chet had not died, we would have gone to couples therapy because he had a therapist and because I never met her, but I'm sure they were working on all the stuff that happened in my life. And uh, so I do think that if he had not died, that we would have figured things out and we probably would have ended up in some kind of conciliatory process that helped us reestablish our relationship and find that baseline again and move on. Um, there were enough close moments very near his death that made me feel like he regretted what he had done, but he just didn't have the energy to talk about it. He didn't have the mental clarity to, for a, a discussion. And hey, I never fell out of love with the guy. So it's not like I wanted to leave him. I didn't. So if you had found out that he had been having an affair um, with the juicer prior to him being diagnosed with cancer, do you think you would have stayed with him? Or do you think you would have been inclined to work things out because you'd been together for so long and you loved him? This is really like a game of hindsight now. So in a way, uh, you know, this is, um, uh, I'm just making this up, right? Because we can never go back and do those things. And today I know what I want to believe and what I want to think and how I want to feel. And so the story I tell is going to fit with all that. And I think he made a mistake. I think people make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Certainly I made my own share of mistakes. And I think he regretted it. And I think he was trapped. And I think that in that kind of a situation with a couple, that if a person overreacts, they can push the other party deeper into the ill-fated affair. And so I think to try and hold a more suspended position, not making decisions too quickly or forcing choices too quickly. And look, I'm, I'm not a jealous person, maybe I should have been, and I'm not into revenge, uh, until a lot later when I thought about it a lot. But in general, I didn't think I was anyway. <laughs> I'd like to think I'm not. Uh, but yeah, I do think that this was something that we were good enough friends that we would have overcome. Because a big part of my loss of him in my life was that he was my best friend. And so uh, there was a lot of vacancy in his absence. That's what I figured that you would answer because you were best friends. And um, so we have another question um, from Karen Brooks Graves. Have you resolved the anger you had toward Chet? And she says that's a hard process. Yes. Uh, I 
think that in the in the big picture, I have. In the little picture, I could run across something somewhere, a memory, uh, a piece of paper. It could trigger a little hostility. I mean, come on, you know. I mean, I uh, yeah, I I could get really pissed at him. I will say uh, we dream. I dream, and he's frequently in my dreams, and we argue in my dreams all the time. So, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting thing to witness. I believe I have forgiven him completely and unequivocally, but boy, would I like to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think we can all, all relate. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I'm just going to bring it up because it's the pink elephant in the room. Okay. Um, uh, did you ever confront the juicer? Well, the, the little that I confronted her was the scene in the book the night before she left when we were sitting in my living room and she told me she lost Chet once in 1984 and once then. And that was kind of, I got up and left the room because that my head was a train wreck when she said that. And she, I never really had spoke with her again, except to say goodbye at the door of my house. I uh, did not, I did not want to be in touch with her. Actually, I should rephrase that. I did speak with her on the phone once, right near Chet's death, when she was calling and begging to come and see him. And uh, Look, that was a very quick conversation. It was pretty intense for all concerned. The answer was no, and that was it. But I did not confront her in a, the chick fight sort of way that I think we all sort of fantasize about. <laughs> did you do? I mean, I did in the book. I had to write that celebrity death match scene because I did fantasize about a chick fight. I mean, I did fantasize about smacking her around, meeting her in a parking lot, throwing <laughs> her up against the wall, pin her, pulling her hair, everything you think. Yeah, come on. Yeah. But in real life, no. No, so it might be you... why it took me so long to process all this, you know, because I did, uh, you know, that that urge to be tidy on the outside, on the inside, it can be like over compartmentalization. So n even now, you wouldn't like to hand her a copy of this book just to say, I'm okay. Yeah. I'm okay, despite everything. Yeah, I would really hope she never enters my life again. I would really hope that because that's dark energy and I don't really want that in my life. She's a person who really wanted to hurt me in a really perverse way by copying me and going on vacation where I went on vacation yeah. and drinking what I drank and doing all these weird, creepy things. And I read the emails that she sent to friends of mine about describing sex acts with my husband, right? So she definitely wanted to hurt me. So I don't, uh, I don't want that energy in my life. Uh, I have no idea. Chad always said she was a broken doll. She had problems with alcohol and she had issues with depression. And I don't even know if she's alive. So I don't, I just don't want that in my life. That would be like stepping in shit. I understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I still would have liked the I like know, that. I know. We can fantasize, can't we? <laughs> I'm like, bam! This is going down. <laughs> Hold my earrings. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. We had another one come up there. Do we have another question up there? Yes, there are several. Yeah. Okay. I can't Lisa. see them. Okay, Lisa oh. Fondren asks, why did you move to Oregon? Why not New England, Maine, et cetera? Well, I really needed to shake off my history. I, I didn't know that right when I sold the farm, but I stumbled around the East Coast for a year. 
And I was really thinking that I was going to stay there because I have so many beautiful friends there. But everywhere I went, it just reminded me who I was, who I had been. The memories of, oh yeah, this is what I did there. This is when we did this. Oh, that was the year of that. And the city of Boston, God, we lived in five different places in Boston. There's no escape for me there. And certainly in the Berkshires, we lived there for 18 years. And I couldn't go anywhere in the Berkshires without being, without having this identity. I, I really wanted to escape all that. Now, that was a little like Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz, right? Because I did intentionally leave there and I thought I would get well mentally by leaving the scene behind, but I took it all with me on the inside. And uh, I came to Portland because uh, I had, have a very good friend here in Seattle, where I am right now. And I had two good friends in Portland, three women I love. And I came here to visit them and hang out. And Portland's very affordable compared to the East Coast. And I really like the Pacific Northwest. And it's my own adventure. I don't have any history here. So no one looks at me and, and knows I was a widow, am a widow. No one knows anything about me at all. And so I have the complete freedom to just be a different person. And that's nice. Cool. Yeah. Reinventing yourself is yes. Um, yes. a gift. Yes. Yeah, I always found that wherever I went, there I was. And so I could never escape myself. <laughs> well, to your point, to your point, I, I really saw that clearly. And that's what caused me to focus on finishing the book here in Portland. Because yes, you're right. I brought all that baggage with me. So there I was making my great escape from the East Coast, drove 3,000 miles, rented an apartment here, was alone with myself, and it all sucked. And I spent like a year here being really depressed. And I started my blog because I was sick of writing a memoir about my sucky life. And the blog went pretty well and it gave me a lot of perspective and it helped me understand myself better. And I finished the book and it's like taking a good shit. It's out of me now. <laughs> <laughs> When did you consider yourself a writer? Like, when did you say, I want to write? Well, I started writing when I was a teenager. Uh, I wrote a novel in like 1991. And, uh, you know, I wrote that book of essays on farming that never went anywhere. And I had been employed as a grant writer and a marketing communications writer. So I was doing technical writing and things like, you know, brochures and PowerPoint presentations for years. And once I realized that I was going to sell the farm, I wanted to start writing stories about it because I thought my memoir was about the farm. And yeah, that was like a really <laughs> big realization. But the original title for my memoir, you know, back before I even left the farm, was Crazy Wife Farm. And I thought there was going to be a picture of me with cows on the cover. And I thought the whole thing was going to be stories about farming. And I just didn't want to talk about my feelings at all or what happened to me personally in any way. And it, it was coming to this realization that until I was just really honest about what really happened, I was never going to be clear of it. And so I started writing more about my feelings and then the title of the book didn't make sense anymore. And so the whole thing, the whole project was reconceived in the last year before it was published. That leads me to another question about the book. Yes. The cover, yes. your cover picture. Yes. And I read your blog yes. was it yesterday. Yes. The crater. On is that the crater? That's the think? crater. It's right there. It's not a crater. Well, man. it's, I mean, crater's pretty subjective, but I can't tell you how many people thought I should airbrush that off the cover of oh. my book. And I was like, did you not get the point of my book? 
you know, oh. this is not about perfection. I am not airbrushing anything, you know. I worked to keep this. This is my pet crater. <laughs> I have a I have a crater, but mine is more like a moon crater and it's it's bigger around and it's dug out, but not yours is kind of a, a deep hole. Mine I have one right there. Mm. So interesting. I thought um the look on your face. Yeah. It's like, oh my gosh, that's um looks like distress, but well, again, it? I really didn't want a beauty shot on the cover of my book. So I had been blogging already for a year by the time my book came out. And I learned from blogging that when I put a picture of my face with a blog post, it gets an exponentially greater response. If I put a picture of something esoteric or abstract or a landscape, uh, people can just blow by that. After a while, people start to recognize my face and my face becomes a signal. Oh yeah, that's Billy Rest. That's her blog. And so marketing, again, I realized that putting my own face on my book would really tie together the work I've been doing for the last year and a half writing the blog. And uh -huh. it couldn't be a beauty shot because that's just not what it's about. Yeah. I get it now, and I I was interested to read your blog yesterday. So. Thank you. Good. Uh, I like it. Okay, we have lots of questions here. Okay, um, Amanda Kiba Wilson wrote: Since therapy is mentioned in the title, did you see a therapist, or your process was more introspection and self therapy through writing? Did My you go to a therapist? I did not go to a therapist uh, regarding any of the issues in a book. I was in therapy when I was in my 20s. But for this situation, I didn't. It was self-therapy and I was really trying to use writing as the exercise to see what happened to me with greater clarity and also forgive, to really forgive because I didn't remember or even think about my own infidelity until, truthfully, I was driving from New York City to Portland in 2017. And then, you know, you're by yourself and you're driving and your mind is like a blank screen. And all of a sudden, this stuff shows up and I'm remembering things and I'm like, whoa, yeah, wow. How could I have been so self-righteous about so many things and I forgot all about some of that other stuff that I did. And I had affairs with married men when I was in my 20s. And payback's a bitch, you know? The arc of karma is long and it bends <laughs> toward payback. And that's for real. Um, yeah, I'll never see infidelity the same way because I realized that it was so meaningless to me to have relationships with married men in my 20s, so 40 odd years ago, never one second occurred to me that there was gonna, that boomerang was gonna come back around and get me. <laughs> yep. Yep. Oh. <laughs> yep. yep. <laughs> okay, Sandra Lynn Dillard says, I had a juicer. I moved 4,500 miles away with my husband of 20 years to Maui, only to find out on social media after the move, he had taken her to the exact town we moved to for a two-week vacation while I was home taking care of our business and mine and his kids. I have such a story to tell. How do I get started? So what would be your writing advice? My writing advice would be to start writing and to write every day and to tell the story in all its bits and pieces and tell your reflections and describe the places and think of it as a mosaic. And every time you write, you're just writing a little piece of the puzzle. Don't overwhelm yourself with thinking about the whole thing. The most important thing is to write every day because writing is a practice. You get better at it the more you do it. And you're not going to get good at it if you just wait to write a book and then sit down and expect it's all going to flow out of you. The, the first step to writing a book is to be a writer. Yes. And somebody had, I can't remember where this is, but somebody had commented about your memory, like you'd remembered so much. Oh, where is it? 
Um, do you see that? No. Okay. I don't, somebody had mentioned memory, but you know, you do have a, you, you know, um, it, how did, how did you, um, here it was, it, was it Marilyn that was amazed at your ability to remember yeah. so much? Did you have personal journals or other media to help you remember? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I always had journal and if I had a really interesting conversation during the day, I would just write it down. So there are very long conversations in the book with my mother, with my husband's mother, and with Chet. And those conversations are about as verbatim as they could be because at the end of the day, I would just sit down and write all that down before I went to bed. And um, I knew that I was going to write something someday. And I also knew that people were saying things you just couldn't make up. And it was so important to capture uh, their point of view, the way they explained it. And I often would talk to Chet's mother on the phone and she, you know, had some drug issues and she would go into these long, long stories and, oh, I could just write them forever. Um, so that's one thing about memory, capturing things that really happened in real time by writing them. But I will say, there's quite a lot of, you know, brain research that shows that our memories are really unreliable. Oh, and yeah. that we end up believing pretty much what we want to believe. And that our memories are really just stories we tell ourselves. And the story we tell ourselves can be very warped by who we're with and our intentions and other circumstances. And so memories are not reliable. There's a great and book on it. Seven, it's called The Seven Sins of Memory. So there you go. In the, <laughs> the Seven Sins of Memory. And let me say, I probably committed all of them. <laughs> and and it, it was because of that that I realized that my memory was very self-righteous at the beginning of the book. I was remembering all the things I did right and all the things he did wrong. Then as I started to remember some of the stuff I did wrong, I was like, whoa, what kind of jerk are you? And then, you know, now, now I look at pictures and read old letters and talk to people who knew us. And I just realized that memory's really a made up story. And it's, it's a, my take on the truth at the time I wrote the book. And I wonder if 20 years from now, I'll have all the same feelings. We, we don't oh. know. Um, we all have the choice every day to make up the story that we want to believe. You know, which story are we going to give? You know, I'm awesome. I'm going to totally win this yes, day. Yes, or yes, yes. I'm horrible <laughs> and I'm not going to make it through this. You know, it's like, which, which one do you feed? Um, so we have, we have so many questions here. Um, Esther said, I loved your poems. In the book, you talk about how writing poetry helps you get through hard times. My favorite was in the beginning of chapter 15, describing yourself as slipping. Are you still writing poetry? I am not writing poetry because I'm doing okay. If I ever start feeling really bad again, I'll probably start writing poetry again. I wrote hundreds of poems and they're not all good, but they all really helped me just process my emotions, especially because I was spending so much time by myself and I was keeping secrets. So it was a lot of mental isolation and the poetry really helps me uh, exercise um, a lot of the things I was feeling. Thank you for liking my poetry. I, I love the poems I put in the book and it makes me happy to hear somebody say they liked them. So thanks a lot. Um, and Tracy said, have you thought about a film version of the book? If so, who would you cast? Well, that's an interesting question because I'm too old to play myself in my own book now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that I sucks. couldn't, <laughs> off the tip of my tongue, 
Uh, I think whoever played me in my book would probably have to be somebody in their 40s who would age to their 60s over the course of a film, if the film followed the book. And uh, I, I uh, honestly, I don't have an actress in her 40s off the tip of my tongue that-, that She'd I have to be as good as Mandy Moore. Mandy Moore did that for This Is Us. Okay. She's aged really well, so I'm thinking- well, You know you who go. I see as you, but she's too old now, Annette so, Benning. Well, that's the thing. See, I, I, we're already too old to yeah. play in the, the book. Yeah, so it's, it has to be somebody in their 40s who can age to their who, 60s. Who can so, age. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Karen says, do you write down your dreams? Sometimes I do, yes. Yes. Do you There's wake up and do it immediately or do they come back to you throughout the day? When I, wake up, when I wake up, I consciously remember them. So when I wake up, like in those first few minutes, I think, oh, wow, that was an amazing dream. Okay, what happened? And I go through everything that happened. And re-experience the dream with the idea of imprinting it on my memory. And then sometime later in the day, I'll definitely write it down. She also wants to know, um, who is your favorite writer? Well, it's kind of funny. It's changing all the time. But uh, lately, I'm really liking uh, Isabella Allende. And uh, she, uh, I've only read two of her books, but um, one of them was called uh, The House of the Spirits. It was her first book. It came out in the 80s. And it is really very, very creative and an extraordinary story of generations of women in a Mexican family. And it includes something called magical realism, which mm -hmm. fascinates me as a literary device. But more recently, she's written a book called The Long Petal of the Sea, and that's petal like P-E-T-A-L. And uh, The Long Petal of the Sea was the poet Pablo Neruda's name for Chile. It turns out, I didn't know this till I read the book, but Isabel Allende is uh, Chilean, and her godfather, who I think was also her uncle, Salvador Allende, was the first democratically elected president of Chile and was assassinated um, in one of those nasty things the United States does on the side um, and opened the door for the fascist dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet. But she is my age. Ha! And uh, it's a great story that spans um, 70 years. And so you get to see uh, people evolve in the story over generations and become old and how their youthful experience influenced their age. And I just want to say her oldest characters have the best sex in the book. And that's very important <laughs> to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> From sex to death. I, yes. I mean, I have to talk to you about death because okay. um, that is a, a major component of this book is, yeah. uh, and it, and there's a whole movement, death positivity. And I think this book is a shining example of that in that you and your husband um, did, ex you took, you did death the way he wanted it. He, he took control of his death, which I, I don't think a lot of people do in our society because we're so um, death averse. We don't want to think about it until we're in the thick of it. And um, you, he had a plan. So, what is your plan? Do you have a plan? Oh, that is such a good question. Because I'm in a really difficult spot. Uh, I don't have someone in my life that would be the person who would handle my death in the way that I handled his. Uh, I don't have relatives or family members uh, that would do that. I, I don't, I just don't have them. It's not that they're in my life and they wouldn't do it, but I just don't have people in my life. And, and my friends, of course, are my own age. And, you know, the tricky thing about it was, is that we were in our early fifties when Chet got sick and died. And so I was perfectly able to care for him. I 
hope that I live a nice long life. And I think that means that we're going to have to envision a world 20 years from now, 10, 20, 30 years from now, where people like us have a way of organizing their own death without relying on uh, family members to be part of it. Because the older we get, the less likely that is to happen. So it's a very interesting question because of course I would love to have a beautifully orchestrated death and I would love to be surrounded by my friends, but look at the world today and think about how the pandemic is affecting these ideas. They simply aren't possible. So I know how I feel about death. I know what I believe and that I have thought about it since the pandemic hit because I realized that the best laid plans of all of us to do something cool or trendy or performance art or religious or whatever with your death, that moment can be taken away from you. And so what is in your heart? What do you believe about death? And when your time comes, Will you embrace it? Will you prepare yourself? And will you believe that the experience is worthy of your curiosity and joy? Because I think you need to feel those things in order for it to be a beautiful experience. Did, this is, did you ever watch the film, How to Die in Oregon? And Pam, it's still on my list in my computer. <laughs> I know you told me like two months ago to watch it, but I haven't watched it now. Sorry. Well, you live in a wonderful state um, okay. in that you have more choices than um, it's a death with dignity state. And if any of you are unaware of what that is, it means that if you are terminal, um, that you have the option to end your own life so that you don't have to suffer. Um, I believe Oregon, Washington State. Um, there are a few others where that you can do that. So you have a little more control. And I know it's a, a big um, controversial topic, so I'll stop with that. But I'll just say that Oregon is a great place if you are terminally ill. Well, thank you for that. And I just want to say, Pamela Schulzvik's first book was called Death Becomes Her. And if you have any interest in uh, how people die, how people approach death when they know it's coming, and if you're at all frightened of it, Pam wrote a brave and pretty darn funny story about coping with her own fears about death. And I think that it is something that we all need to uh, get real about especially now, especially oh, when yes. it's in the news every day, the math is in the news every day. And the fact is, we're all gonna die. Spoiler we know alert. we're gonna die. <laughs> you know, it's a thing, it's a real thing. Death is a thing, everybody's doing it. Very popular, <laughs> yeah. it, right? Especially, especially <laughs> in Texas right now. Especially yeah. in Texas, sadly, but- It's terrible. You know, Jokes aside, the fact is that it has really been interesting for me to think about, and I hope for a lot of people to think, if you got sick and you were in the hospital and you had to be put in isolation and you were cut off from people you love and care about because of the issue of risk, could you still have a good death. And I want to believe that the choice to have a good death is all inside you. It's all what you think. And you can still think the thoughts you need to have to have a serene moment with yourself and reach out and embrace whatever story you believe about what happens in death whether it's religion or nature or science or myth. You have that moment with yourself. And I think, think about it and live into it because if it happens to you, 
You should be there for yourself. <laughs> you should be present at your own death. You and should we be have present. A Do you believe in life after death? That was one of the questions from Karen Marie Sullivan. Oh, hi, Karen. I, I believe in science. And I believe that energy is always just churning and moving toward energy, moving away, you know, chaos, reorganization, things come together and fall apart. And I believe I'm part of that. I believe I'm part of nature. I'm part of the universe. I believe everything is just recycled stardust. And that includes me. And so I don't believe I have a life in the sense of, for example, heaven, which is what my mother believed. But I do believe that I remain connected forever, that my energy and that my stardust right here, it's going right back wherever it came from. It's what I believe. Uh, it's a story that makes me feel like uh, we're all part of one big thing. Cool. Thank you. Um, so we have um, a book to give away. Um, oh my gosh, that went so it, fast. It is Dying Beautifully. And this is um, a very personal book um, that Billy um, wrote and collaborated with a photographer about Chet's death. And we're going to pick someone um, from the group to win a copy of this from Billy. And here's the people who took selfies. I could do it. <laughs> okay, Darlene Armstrong is the oh, winner. All right, How Darlene. Fitting. Yay. Yay. Oh, yay. Yay. So I'm going to need Darlene for you to send me your address so I can forward that on to Billy so she can send you that book. Um, thank you so much, Billy, for, for coming and talking to us tonight. And um, thanks everyone who posed questions and um, participated. It, these are strange times and it helps to um, connect with story and feel connected with other people, even as we're sitting alone in our houses, right. um, feeling very disconnected at times. So thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And, uh, oh, thank you um, all. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. It's been a, a pleasure. Thank you, Billy. And we are going to be picking our August, not our August. Our August book is The Talking Drum. Um, we still have Derailed. Um, we're going to do that on the 22nd, but we're going to pick our September book, correct? Or no, our August book. I'm sorry. July. Is July. Is what day is it? I swear. <laughs> I don't even though I still don't know. <laughs> it is July the 9th. Talking Drum is the book Thank we're you. reading right now. We're going to do a. a a talk with the author Lisa Braxton on August, I believe it's the 6th. And okay. um, so on the 15th, we'll do a, a quick live drawing for that. And my book, Death Becomes Us, is going to be free tomorrow on Amazon Kindle. So grab yourself a copy. Oh, it's good. It's good. All right. Yeah, do hey, your watch for my audio book in August, guys. Thanks. Oh, I can't wait. Oh, that's yeah, right. She's doing You're audio. Recording. And it's her own voice. I It'll love be that. me recording. I love it, it yeah. when the author does their own voice. Yeah, I'm very excited. Like so thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Good Thanks night. for being Thanks. here. Amen. Good night, everybody. Nancy.